So welcome along to the next show of the iPhotography podcast. I'm Stephen, if you've not joined us before. Um, and today we're going to talk to an iPhotography member called Craig Holsom. Craig um, is a fantastic photographer and he's got some beautiful images that he took in Nepal um, a little while ago and the, some brilliant kind of documentary uh, portraits. And I thought they would be fantastic to actually kind of have a little chat about them and kind of his photography travels, because it's not only that um, one trip that he covers, I believe he's, he's done kind of quite a few uh, and taken out this camera. And I thought there'd be a great opportunity to talk about those portraits, maybe you know how he actually approached working in foreign lands, speaking to other people and asking for their photographs. There are little tips and tricks, hopefully, that we can get from him that would really, really help if you're going on a, a foreign holiday this year or next year about kind of how to work and, uh, you know, in, in foreign areas and how to kind of conduct yourself and blend in with the environment a little bit better. Um, so, yeah, we're going to kind of bring him onto the podcast, have a little chat about some of his photos. If you're watching this on a YouTube video, um, we'll put a lot of images up that we talk about as well from Craig. Um, and again, we'll also kind of put a link down in the description for iPhotography Plus members to be able to access Craig's personal gallery so you can have a look at more of the images as well. Um, but if you want to catch a little bit more information about iPhotography, again, there should be a link in the description to this video, this podcast, um, where you can kind of join one of our courses or join all our courses, our Plus membership. You've also got links in there for our flip cards and a few other amazing products that are really, really, really helpful tools uh, for brand new photographers. If you want to learn about the basic camera settings, wildlife, portraiture we've got loads of courses and lots of different topics so check us out uh, the link is in the description for that um, i think we've got craig coming on to the podcast now so i'm going to stop my talking and we will start the show So, Craig, welcome along to another episode of the iPhotography podcast. It's, it's lovely to have you here. And I know, um, I say, not yet are you a world famous photographer. I'm, I'm sure you're kind of on the uh, on the steps towards it. So not everyone may be that familiar with yourself and your photography. But if you're watching the YouTube version of this podcast, you'll be able to see a lot of Craig's images. But we'll make sure we kind of put a link to, um, to it in the description of this podcast. So you've got a place that you can go and find Craig's images. Um, but Craig, yeah, I just want you to kind of introduce yourself for the benefit of people that don't know you yet and to give them a little bit of a backstory as to how you got into photography and you know how you got up to it where you are now well my name is craig Holsom. i am actually a family physician uh in a little town called washington missouri and i first i think picked up my ca first camera in college it was a little uh, minolta 35 millimeter and i knew absolutely nothing about photography, like so many people who are getting started. Um, and couldn't wait to go out and buy my first roll of film and shoot up 36 photos and rush them into the developer where I then waited about two weeks to get them back, only to find out that probably not one was usable, you know, whether <laughs> that was something cut off or a thumb over the, the viewfinder. Um, but I said, like, okay, I'll practice. I'll work on this a little bit more. The problem though is when you're a struggling student, film is expensive and developing is expensive mm -hmm. and you're busy with your coursework. So, you know, if I shot 300 photos, all of college, that'd be pushing it. Wow. So it just kind of fell to the wayside. And then I started my uh, medical residency and didn't have time. Um, which is very frustrating looking back because I was stationed in, Texas, and then Sicily, Spain, Maine, and didn't take a single photo in any oh. of those places, uh, which, like I said, I could kick myself for that now. Oh, so, it's a bit the benefit of hindsight, I suppose. I, I, I do it the same that I actually I came to America once. I you know, spent about a what, week, two weeks in New York. Um, and again, I'd shot a lot of pictures on film at the time. And it's just one of those things, I, I suppose, maybe I assumed that I would go back maybe in the future or maybe a bit more regularly um, than just one time. So I've really got like one picture from that that whole trip. And I've never been back. And that was like well, nearly 20 years ago. But yeah, so I understand. <laughs> but, but I mean, do you, do, you, do you travel a little bit more now? Or are you a bit more, uh, you know, when you do travel, do you take your camera a lot more? Well, of course. And they said my, my first camera as a physician because someone told me about this new technology called digital and how boy <laughs> you could just shoot all kinds of photos and 
So I rushed out and I got this Minolta one megapixel. <laughs> and it wasn't any cheaper because I think if you shot 20 to 30 photos, you went through your batteries. Uh, <laughs> and it was so slow. If I was going to shoot a group photo, everybody had to hold still for a count of three. You know, so I, I, I really didn't find it being that great of a technology, but as you know, time went on, of course, digital improved and I saw pictures other people were doing. So I went out and got a Canon T2i with a 18 to 200 lens, which you know, at the time I just, that, that was phenomenal. Glass now probably wasn't as good, but it, it was a good starter camera and that became my workhorse. Ah. And then about 27 years ago, we started doing medical mission trips. Uh, and so we've actually have done 25 trips down to Belize. And so I would always take my camera with me down there. Still didn't always know what I was doing, <laughs> but, uh, you know, everything in, in program mode and the pop-up flash on top of the camera and all the things you, you kind of look back and cringe now, but <laughs> it, it gave me the chance to learn to shoot people and shoot people in their environment. Uh, and to be able to show people back home just how different life is uh, in other countries. And one of the things I like doing is one of the seventh graders, uh, seventh grade classes uh, in our uh, community would help me pack my medicines for the trip. And so I would give them a half hour presentation on mission medicine. They'd pack the meds for you know one and a half to two days. And then when I came back from the trip, I'd give them a follow-up presentation with slides that I could show them from where I had been. Uh -huh. And, you know, a couple of the examples that really stuck out, you know, we all think we work so hard. And so I'd ask the boys, how many of them have to mow the lawn and, you know, think it's really hard and all the hands go up. So I showed them a picture of a young boy on his knees with a machete cutting the grass in front of their home. Wow. Well, how did uh, they react? <laughs> they, they were kind of shocked. And same thing for the girls uh, saying, well, how many you have to do the laundry? You know, is it pretty tough? And then show the picture of what we call the laundromat uh, down Valley of Peace, which is a refugee camp. And it's basically four posts with a corrugated tin roof and concrete slabs with the well next to it. So they'll get the water from the well and wash their clothes on the concrete slabs and then have to, of course, go hang it up to dry and then fold it and put it away, which is just a little tougher than what we do. Yes, yeah, just, just a little bit. I mean, it, it kind of segues on nicely, actually, as to, to the main reason as to why um, I invited you on to come and chat on the podcast, because, yeah, you, you've, you've traveled the world a, a lot and you've got some phenomenal portraits. But recently, maybe going back a couple of months, you posted a, a series of images uh, of portraits that you taken in Nepal. Was that right? Correct. And they were just absolutely outstanding, really, for the, the level of detail, the character. And it really kind of offered a scene that not many people see, as you say, unless you go into these places, these countries that aren't, they're not the, the tourist hotspots, let's say. Um, they, they are, as you say, you know, you, you've been part of it for, for work reasons. But these these images, and we'll say we'll put a lot of them up um, as you, if you're watching this as a, a YouTube video instead of the actual audio podcast. Um, they are absolutely sensational. There's such a range of images, be it kind of close up uh, headshots and then kind of capturing people in work, more environmental portraits. But is this something that's kind of always been of interest to you to kind of capture people and their workings as opposed to it being a staged portrait like in a studio to prefer the the kind of natural environment oh, definitely i prefer the natural i mean portraits are fun for catching the moment and you know again there, we all have people in our lives that none of us know how long we're going to be around but you know you've got a portrait they're there forever uh and and so those are those are nice but i'd much rather catch people in their natural environment without the the cheese smile uh and i, I just think it it, it tells a story uh, yeah. And again, this was part of a mission trip. I, um, we had one year we had to cancel our trip to Belize, but I still want to do a trip. So I went with a group called Project Compassion to Romania, where we worked out of some gypsy villages. And uh, so I had some connections there and they called me a few years later and wanted to know if I wanted to go to Nepal. Wow. And 
course, I, I jumped on that. Now, the one thing that helped tremendously was the year before I turned 50 and my wife saw I was really starting to enjoy photography. So for my 50th birthday, got me a photo expedition with National Geographic down to Costa Rica and Panama. Wow. Uh, with a photographer named Ralph Lee Hopkins. And all of a sudden I start learning how to use this thing called aperture mode, what this <laughs> exposure compensation means, you know, uh, just, you know, how to read, start to read a histogram, you know, a little bit on photo editing. And I mean, it was just phenomenal. Uh, I, I learned so much. And of course, the biggest lesson I learned was backing up because oh, yeah. During the trip, I was downloading onto my computer every day, uh, playing with the photos. And then about the third day into the trip, my computer screen cracked. It was an old, older laptop going in and out of humidity. But I thought, that's okay. You know, we'll get by. And I probably shot about 2,500 to 3,000 photos, which to me, I thought nobody ever shoots that many, you know, for a week-long trip. <laughs> Uh, and then while sitting in the airport on the way home, um, of course, putting my cards in my camera, just wanted to keep looking at my photos, got home, couldn't wait to show my wife and the, my camera or card case must have fallen out of my pocket and I lost all my photos, except oh. for the first three days that had been backed up. Oh. So that was a very important lesson about back up your photos. <laughs> yeah, we, we you don't have at least it. three copies, you don't have copies. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I always kind of go with a kind of an online copy if you're using like the cloud, but then like an offline version in case one fails. And I used to have um, a boss that ran a studio with me and he always kept, he basically kept all his original images on the SD cards and then he made multiple copies. So he had like uh, memory cards everywhere across his house. He treated it like he would film and you kind of kept the original uh, uh, film role. He yeah. did the same with memory cards and it was incredible, but you're so right. I've unfortunately have heard stories many, many times like this. And I've, I've been subjected to it as well, where I've lost cards or just lost images through transfer. And it's heartbreaking because especially when you're going abroad, it's not as if you can just, you know, nip around another weekend to go and take those shots again. They, they're, they're totally one-offs, aren't they? But I'm so glad we've got so many of those images from Nepal in, in the gallery. I mean, they are a mixture, as you say, because of you know, people at work and then there are some headshots. But even kind of catching these headshots, they obviously look like they've been dedicated and, and, and set up and, you know, the way that you've had to approach somebody to ask. But if you don't speak, uh, you know, the local language, how do you actually kind of deal with, you know, asking them for a portrait, asking them to take their picture? Well, hey, first of all, it's a lot of smiling and being polite. And if you start to point the camera towards someone and they wave you off, then no means no, you know, yeah. you just do it. Uh, but a lot of times smiling and pointing at the camera and, uh, and then, you know, when possible, if you're close enough, showing them the photo, you know, when they're done and, and you know, and seeing them smile or laugh, you know, and, and that's good. And of course with kids, they just come around you. They want to take, have their photo taken and show it to you. And I love photographing kids, which is Unfortunately, one of the things you just can't do in some countries anymore is be a middle-aged male and walk up and take a photo of somebody else's child. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> on, these, on these mission trips, and depending on the size of the community, they get to know our group. They know why we're there. Yeah. So it's not threatening. Uh, and especially in the clinic, once you've just provided free health care to someone, if you ask them if you can take their photo, especially you know through the interpreter, and generally they don't tell you no. Oh, that's good. Oh, so you have like an interpreter working alongside you, do you sometimes? Yeah. Now, when we're in Belize, I, I speak enough Spanish to be dangerous, so I usually don't <laughs> have to. But uh, obviously in Nepal and Romania, uh, places like that, then yes, we have interpreters in the clinics. Oh, it's but when great. I walk, but when I'm walking around the community, we don't. So you may have some people who speak a little bit of English, some who don't. Yeah. Uh, but I usually mean, we, we would wear our name tags that we're part of a clinic. Yeah, and at least oh, we right. identify who we were too. So have you picked up any kind of uh, any other language skills then from say like when you were in Romania or N Nepal, et cetera? Did you pick up any dialect that you could use? Uh, not, not really in those places. Uh, uh, I, I wish I had, uh, you know, I, I try to 
pick up a, a basic word here or there. I mean, I when I was stationed in Sicily, I learned enough Italian to go to the restaurant, ask directions when they got lost, you know, things <laughs> like that. Uh, the typical tourist kind of things. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but I do. I always do try to read up on the culture before I go. Yeah. Just so I'm, you know, not the ugly tourist in that I try to, you know, respect what's going on. Mm. Uh, and again, being friendly and, and being out there so they see you in the community and, and that you're trying to bl blend in best you can and, and you know, eat where they eat and you know, res respect their culture, I think just goes a long way. Do you find uh, that makes it a little bit easier than when you come to take those photographs that you have maybe immersed yourself a bit more in the culture? Because... Um, I suppose we're trying to give tips for people that maybe, you know, if they're not necessarily going to Nepal, but if they were going to a, a foreign country and they do want to kind of capture images, you know, some portraits or some landscape images similar to yours, that they just understand it's the importance of understanding the environment and the, the landmarks, as you said, the culture and traditions. Did you find that was helpful to integrate yourself? Oh, very much so. It's, it's just common courtesy and respect. And if you're respectful for people, they're more tolerant of you. Um, we had one episode in Nepal where, because we were primarily a Christian organization and they were more Hindu and Buddhist, we were told, well, don't talk about Christ or anything like that. You know, and we didn't just, yeah. you know, show your actions and, and be good. And, but because of us being Christian, they actually posted guards at the clinic just out of an abundance of safety. Oh, really? And we didn't need it. Every, everybody was fantastic. So one morning I got up early, I saw this temple up on a hill. I wanted to get some shots and I'm walking at this point. I've, I've got my 7,200 and uh, my, my nice long lens and I'm walking and I didn't realize I'm right next to an army camp. Oh, but you don't wow. want to be a foreigner walking around with the camera at somebody <laughs> else's base. And this officer approached me and I kind of put, no, I'm, I'm not taking photos. I'm not taking photos. And he looked at me, he goes, I know you, you're a doctor. And oh, I said, well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to, I, I didn't know you were here. I just saw that temple up there. He goes, oh, it's okay. Yelled something out in Nepalese. They opened up the gate. A guy escorted me up so I can get pictures of the temple. Matter of fact, the one even posed with his rifle, very proud. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so yeah, because they, as you say, they knew you, they didn't fear you. They, they kind of, as you said, they recognized you as well. It helped, you know, basically kind of get you access to places that you may have not otherwise gotten to, but exactly. That's incredible. I mean, now that you actually mentioned about kind of what, what lens you're shooting on, um, though, as much as the kit doesn't always kind of make a, a, a big difference, we always say, obviously, it's, you know, the photographer that makes the image, but what, what are you actually shooting on now? What's your kind of main kit? Well, I, I've worked my way up on the camera. So I made it from a T2i to a 70D. And then now I'm up to a 1DX. Uh, Whoa, we'll lovely we'll see how long my arms hold out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty uh, heavy, isn't it? I, I've used the uh, the Mark Mark Two and Mark Three for a number of years, and yeah, they're, they're quite beefy um, kind of cameras. Right? Is it the Mark One that you've got? I've got the Mark Two. The Mark Two, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know exactly how much that weighs. And what lenses are you what are you using? Uh, the seventy two hundred is still my go to. Uh, I've got the. Uh, uh, 24, 105 is kind of a nice one. Just walking around town a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, then I've got an 18, 35 wide angle for, for landscapes. Yeah. Uh, and then just this past year, a, a 100, 400, uh, for trying to do more wildlife, uh, and birds. Yeah. And of course get a, a couple of teleconverters, uh, a, a one, four and a two. Yeah. On top. Uh, yeah. So, so you uh, find like, um, zoom lenses, sorry, it seemed to be kind of like your, your go-to. Do you find that that just gives you flexibility? Like when you're, you're out shooting, you don't have to be changing lenses too much. Is that what you prefer? Exactly. Cause there are a lot of conditions you don't, you know, it can be dusty or you're on the beach and you don't want to be changing lenses anyway. And it's, we actually, we did another trip with my wife after she saw how much fun I had with national geographic. We did uh, a trip to uh, the Galapagos. Wow. Uh, and then, so I, I carried two cameras. I had my T2i and the 70D, so I could have the long lens on one and my wide angle on the other because it was you know windy and dusty and sandy. And, yeah. and, and again, I wish I knew as much back then. I mean, I've got some good shots from there, but you know, 
it's always that hindsight. Every time you learn something new, it's like, boy, I could have used that in this situation. Oh, yeah. And that's it. And you think, oh, I don't want to go back to certain destinations and do this again and do that. But I mean, well, kind of, I suppose, obviously, over the past, what, 18 months now, since the world has somewhat been on pause, as we were just talking about before we came on air, you know, hopefully, um, you know, things are starting to get a little bit easier and a little bit, a uh, bit more accessible for everybody. But for yourself, Craig, kind of maybe looking, I'll say six, 12 months down the line, do you have any more plans to go out on any missions or, you know, with work or any other kind of private trips, you know, well, and anything else? They're on hold right now. Uh, but uh, my, the next one I'm hoping, but again, it depends on COVID is I have a son who's uh, in the Marines and he is stationed with his wife and our 16 week old granddaughter in Okinawa. Oh, wow. So, you know, we FaceTime, but it's, it's not the same. So I'm hoping maybe in October, if Japan catches up on their vaccines and they're at about like just under 6%. Uh, so if, if they, you know, they're making progress and if it gets better, then I'd like to go out there and visit and see some of Japan yeah. Uh, as well of course my granddaughter oh indeed uh, well that's it and you know that'd be a great chance for you to carry on practicing your portraiture but with yeah. uh with your is she your first granddaughter or grandchild I uh I, she's my fourth Four. yeah and so actually i have another granddaughter who's two and a half who i hadn't seen for a year and a half until uh last month and oh. then i they live outside boston so i got to travel out to boston and, and see her again and spoil her rotten yeah. Uh, and then I have two grandsons who live fairly close who are uh, 10 months and two and a half. So, oh, wow. yeah, that's, so that's a lot of fun on the portraiture. You're right. I was going to say it gives you a good chance to go, good opportunity to practice because it's um, I suppose you get a photograph in young children. Um, it's it's AI very, servo. very different. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <AI servo> in person. <laughs> It's, it's very, very similar to how you would photograph wildlife. And I, yes, I think is. there is some sort of parallel to be drawn between wild animals and children, but I, <laughs> I won't go down that kind of rabbit hole too much. But this is one question that we, we ask everybody that kind of comes on the podcast. Um, we call it the, the time travel question. And you, you kind of touched on it a few times already about uh, how you'd wish you'd done that, you know, kind of looking back in hindsight. But if you could go back in time to pretty much when you started out with that Minolta camera, and if you could give yourself one bit of advice that you know now to your younger self, at the time to maybe make photography a little bit easier for you is there anything that you you would say anything one specific kind of rule or, or something to remember that you think would make it easier well actually a couple the, the first one is learn to see not just to look i look at a lot of my old photos and it's like dang if i had just taken two steps to the right this would be such a better photo and so uncluttered or if I just squatted down and shot up or got down a little lower, you know, so I've, I've gotten a lot better of getting into the habit of setting up my background first before I take my photo, shoot, shoot back to front, not front to back. And that, oh, that would make point. a huge difference in yeah. photography because we've all seen the signpost or the, the branch coming out of somebody's head. <laughs> and, uh, so learning to look at that. The other thing is, again, I've done you know, a lot of the, the videos and disc and things like that. Uh, Joel Sertari, who does the uh, photo arc for National Geographic, uh, had a comment that he said, don't forget to touch the whales. And what he meant by that is he, he would go with groups to Baja uh, and the Sea of Cortez, and you go out on Zodiacs and the whale calves would literally come up to the zodiac and people could touch them wow. so the problem is you'd have people on the boat who were so fixated on the photography all they did was take pictures and video at the time and they never touched the whale so his comment was yes it's important but don't forget the moment i mean look yeah. what you got right here the opportunity to touch a whale and you're just sitting there taking pictures the whole time so yes get yeah. your pictures but you know don't forget the moment that you're in too and enjoy it yeah, yeah, I, I I fully agree. I was actually watching. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched the film. Um, this I think it's called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. It's with Ben Stiller. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically he's the, he is a, an asset manager. He looks after all the photos that go through life magazine. That was like his character role. And there was one picture missing and he basically kind of traveled the world to go and find this one picture. And at the very end, the original photographer who was out taking photographs of snow leopards, he's like seeing the snow leopard on the ridge and 
and um, Ben Stiller sat next to him saying, are you not going to take the picture? He's like, no, sometimes it's better just to sit and watch and enjoy the moment, you know, mm-hmm. because that's that's a memory that, you know, is similar to what a photograph will give you, but it's an experience that you can easily forget if you're just sat behind the viewfinder all the while. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's quite relatable, I'd say as well. But has that kind of changed photography for you? Did you kind of, uh, you know, have you noticed that after a number of years and started to kind of slow down on how many pictures you took and just, you know, immerse yourself in the situations? Yeah, I, I have. I mean, I said when my uh, oldest daughter, you know, got married, people are, are you going to take photos? It's like, no, you know, I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the moment. It's just like I used to do deliveries as part of my practice. And people said, well, did you deliver your children? No. I'm going to sit here and be a daddy. I mean, I get to deliver lots of babies, but I only get to be a daddy so many times. Yeah, Um, so true. And and then, you know, sunrises, sunsets are are beautiful. I enjoy sunrise the most because usually there's not a lot of people there, if anybody else. Sunset, everybody's still up. And I can just sit there and enjoy the moment and watch, you know, the glory and the magnificence of what's happening and and, uh, unfolding in front of me. And then, yeah, I'll take some pictures and then I'll just sit there and, you know, listen to the birds and listen to the sounds of the ocean as mm-hmm. I'm watching the sun come up. I mean, that, that's peaceful. Yeah, very holistic. And, and it's a lovely way to enjoy the art. And I, I think it makes people, um, you know, more in tune with their environments as well. If they just sit there, you know, especially with wildlife, we are, we're not with our wildlife course, uh, our tutor, Rachel, just says, you know, sometimes it's good just to sit and, you know, get to know the surroundings and basically not take any photographs and, and just really kind of, you know, look at the moments, look at the opportunities around you before you even pick up the camera. And I, I think it's so nice that, that you, you do that as well for your photography. It's, it's something that I would, I would recommend to many people that are listening or watching this as well, but um, that's absolutely lovely, Craig. I mean, I'm sure there are tons of people who are listening to this, um, listen to this podcast and maybe not watching the YouTube video, um, but would possibly want to have a look at more of your photographs. And do you have any, any uh, websites or social medias that you kind of upload pictures to? Well, unfortunately, I'm, I'm working on that right now. That one was, I've, I've been kind of slow in the social media. I, I don't do Facebook, uh, but I am trying to work on a website now. I actually just got my, uh, an LLC started. Uh, and for my grandchildren, I'm Poppy. And uh-huh. so my company is Poppy Razzi. <laughs> ah, brilliant. I love that. And that, that's lovely for them to be able to see in, in the future as well. But I think this is the magnificence of where the internet is a, is a positive source that you can leave those images on there and people can always go back and see them, you know, even if for, for whatever reason of a memory card or a hard drive corrupts and you've got those pictures on a website, hopefully they, they should always be there for people to see in the future. But yeah, if you, uh, once you've kind of completed your website, you'll have to let us know the, uh, the, the, the site handle and everything, and we can kind of add it back into this so people can go and check out if that's okay and those on uh i photography can always go back and look into the archives as well uh, and hopefully see some of my progression over the time from some of my original submissions to hopefully what's getting better i'm like many people i'm a lot more critical of my own work sometimes i submit things because okay you probably ought to submit but um I look back at so much of my photography and say, yeah, it's just not there. I, I, just, I just don't like that one anymore. And people, oh, that's great. It's like, no, because I look at it and I see the flaws immediately. Yeah. And other people just see, oh, that's a beautiful photo. It's like, mm. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a good thing to remember. I mean, I'm just looking at your gallery now and you go back to January 2015 with us. So just over you know six and a half years now. And and some of these images literally on the very first page are absolutely incredible, but I I totally understand that, you know, as you progress, you you always see flaws and and like many artists would do, but I think at the time, it's good to know that you really, really like that image. And I I think that's just a change in tastes and personalities as you develop. But yeah, there is this very, very little wrong, if if anything wrong with, with even just this kind of first 10 pictures that I'm looking at here. And maybe I'll, I'll kind of put up a, a before and after really as to kind of where you were 2015 and where you are now and kind of 2021. Um, but it's it's solid either way. I think it's an absolutely incredible kind of array of images. And you've uh, you've got a picture of a whale as well. It's, um, yeah, it's a, kind of the whale fluke, uh, mm-hmm. you've called it. Did you actually get to touch that whale, did you say? I didn't get to touch that one, no. That was no. a little further off. 
Yeah, it does look a little bit further away, definitely. But there are some cracking images in there. So, Craig, I just want to say thank you very much for, for the time that you've given us and, and the insights and the stories behind some of these wonderful images that we've been looking at. Um, and yeah, and hopefully, you know, if you do any more trips in the future, if you get out to, to Okinawa and uh, the Galapagos and such, um, we'd love to see some more images and maybe we can catch up and do this again in the future. Sure. Superb. Well, thank you very much, Craig, for your time. And if you're listening or watching to this uh, podcast, thank you very, very much for joining us. If you keep uh, subscribing, turn the notifications on, you'll be able to kind of catch the next episode from myself and Craig. We just want to say thank you very much and we'll see you in the future. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.